elements on the periodic table, for the most part, except for the noble gases, don't really like to be by themselves. They want to be with somebody else. And that means that they're going to bond to other elements to be able to form compounds. Now, those compounds can be two different types. When non-metals come together, those are those guys on the right-hand side of the staircase, when they come together, they like to bond by sharing electrons, and that's called a covalent bond, and we call that a molecular compound. Uh, now, I'm going to show you about the simplest types of molecules and molecular compounds. You've got to have these under control before we go on to the ionic ones. So, some elements, uh, like, like nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere, they don't like to actually be those individual types of elements. They'll come together and they will bond covalently again to form molecular elements. Now, which one of those, which, which are they? Well, the diatomic elements are those that like to occur in twos. Now, your teacher is going to be very tricky and is going to try to see if you understand which of the diatomics or which, which elements are diatomic. Sometimes they'll say, well, you have some chlorine gas. Now what they're really saying is, don't write down Cl on your piece of paper, you write down Cl2. Here's the thing. The diatomic elements, and you've got to kind of commit them to memory, but it's pretty easy, are hydrogen gas. That starts off the periodic table, right? H hydrogen element number one. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, or iodine. Hey, now listen, where are they located? Well, pretend you start the periodic table with hydrogen over here next to helium. And that means then that all the diatomics are located in O, see that? No, no. And then group 17, don't include acetine there. So here's the thing. What do you have to know? You gotta know group 7. N, O, and all the group 7, put hydrogen over there too, are diatomic. So you gotta know your no group 7s. No group 7, they're the diatomic elements on the periodic table. Now, there's a couple of other elements that like to occur in aggregates or clumps and that would be sulfur which prefers to be S8 although there is monoatomic sulfur and diatomic sulfur the most popular form of sulfur is S8 and phosphorus is P4 now look anything else on the periodic table when your teacher says write that down or write down a formula or write down that element you just write down well iron Fe tin Sn tungsten W but for the diatomics, you write down H2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, N2, and O2, and sulfur, S8, phosphorus, P4. So, no group 17, S is 8, P is 4, everything else on the periodic table is 1. Now, we can all obviously take some other of the nonmetals, and these two, and put them together in compounds. Again, they're molecular compounds, and this is a molecule right here we have a prefix naming system to be able to put together and name, that's nomenclature, naming the molecules. Now, I want to just alert you to what those prefixes are as we start to do some of these examples. Mono is one, di is two, tri is three. Those are pretty obvious and pretty easy to remember. Four is tetra. A lot of people say quad and stuff like that. No, no, no. Tetra is four, and then penta is five, hexa is six, Hepta 7, octa 8, nona 9, and deca is 10. Mono, di, tri. And then tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. You got to get that totally under control. It's something to commit to memory. There's not a lot that you have to. You know, you got a periodic table to be able to explain to you a lot of stuff, and you can look it up there. But you do have to have some of these things under control to be able to do compounds like this. Okay, let's name some molecules. Now, here's a very common one. <sighs> Breathing it out right now. You are too. CO2. Now, how do you name that? First of all, when we name compounds, we, we use lowercase lettering, and unless you're writing a sentence or something, and then you've you got to capitalize at the beginning of the sentence, uppercase. Otherwise, all compounds that you're going to write, except for some organic compounds that we'll do later, you actually use lowercase all the time. Your teacher might test you on that, so be prepared for it. Well, that's a carbon, and there's two oxygens in that molecule, so that's going to be called carbon space dioxide. So that's very simple because there's two oxygens, dioxide. Now you look at that and you say, well okay, that's that's one carbon. Now can you use that mono? Generally we don't use the mono when it's uh, the first element, but if there's one in the second element, then we'll do the mono part. 
Now, by the way, all compounds are going to end in "-ide", whether they're ionic, ionic compounds or molecular like these are, they're going to end in "-ide", and then there's some special cases later that we'll see some compounds end in "-ate", and "-ite", when we get aggregates called polyatomic ions coming into play later. Now, so CO, that's going to be carbon, and then you've got one oxygen, so that's mon, and we don't write mono and then oxide because then it looks like monoxide. So it's just monoxide. If we've got two letters that are similar, well, identical, we just, we just shorten that up by going monoxide, right? Okay, now, what's this one here then? Well, we've got four phosphoruses here and then ten oxygens. So you know your prefixes, so you're going to go tetra phos for us, and then 10 oxygens makes deca oxide. Now, sorry about running it into there. That's deca oxide, and you can put down now. I know it looks funny because you got the two vowels there, but you got to be able to say it properly. Uh, some people say deca oxide, but it's you can write down deca oxide. So tetraphosphorus deca oxide. S8. Some people are going to say uh, octasulfur. It's not octasulfur. This is just sulfur. Remember, because it's one of those non-metals in its naturally occurring state. So we just say, well, sulfur. We just take for granted it's S8. Don't get confused like that. Don't write down something like Cl2 and call that dichloride or dichlorine or something. That's just chlorine, right? It's a diatomic element. Now, ASBr3 would be arsenic and then tribromide. See that? Lower cases, ends in I, and that would be right there. You can write it down for yourself. Silicon tetraiodide, right? Two words, silicon tetraiodide. Now, here are some chemicals right here I'm going to show you now that have to be, I would say, committed to memory so you can be conversant with some of the common names for some molecules. Now, some molecules have those common names. Here are some of the most important ones to really get familiar with. Uh, ammonia, which is a really terribly noxious type of gas, it'll kill you dead, you're breathing it in. However, it's very important in the manufacturing of fertilizer, it is going to be NH3. Well, it is. It is the NH3 is ammonia. Now, glucose is C6H12O6. That's an important compound because, as you should know, that the sugars we take into our body get metabolized in our body to be able to turn into a monomer called glucose. And that is a very, very important molecule in cellular respiration and in photosynthesis. We'll talk about that later too when we're balancing equations. Ethanol is C2H5OH. And that is the alcohol that you can drink. You can't drink any of the other ones. Well, you can. It's just that they're not that good for you, and you can get killed, die, just by drinking a little bit of things like methanol and propanol, isopropyl alcohol, things like that. Okay, sucrose, akin to glucose in its formula with carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in it, is C12H22O11. Now, you know, you look at these uh, formulas here, and sometimes they're a little tricky to commit to memory, but you know, really, glucose is, if you take a 6, completely out of this and turn it into something called an empirical formula rather than, than this molecular one that you see here. It really is like a C with an H2O. That's the real ratio of carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. It's like carbon water. That's what glucose is. So just try to remember it like that and then just multiply it by six, that carbon water. The sucrose is a little bit trickier. So C12H22O11, just memorize it. Hydrogen peroxide, it's H2O2. That can actually be a very good bleaching agent. You can do that to bleach your teeth. You can have hydrogen peroxide solutions to do that. Uh, bleach your hair too. No, it's just getting white. Ozone, everybody pretty much knows is O3. Commit that to memory too. Hydrogen sulfide is interesting. In our province that we live in, in Alberta, um, hydrogen sulfide is a terrible gas that if it gets released and it's in a high concentrated uh, form, um, you can die just by breathing it in. It replaces oxygen uh, and it has neurological effects that'll kill you dead pretty quickly. So it's an important gas for us to know in Alberta and pretty much everywhere. And it's H2S. And you might look at that formula and you say, hey, that's uh, dihydrogen sulfide. Yeah, it kind of is, but it's just commonly referred to as hydrogen sulfide. Thought you should know. And water, of course, you haven't gone anywhere on this planet very far. 
unless you know that water is H2O, right? So there's some common ones that you got to commit to memory. So know those.